Welcome to rest. Circle, circle, dot, dot. Now I got my to piece together this broken glass. Our God runs toward, not away from the mess. Think about that. We're talking about the creator of everything. I was at the five star last week and you can't make this stuff up. I was getting gas and I walked in to, to pay at the register and I was on this side of the register and I looked across and at the other register was this older gentleman, uh, probably in his 70s or 80s, and, and he had this, uh, I noticed a, a veteran hat on and we made eye contact. Have you ever made eye contact with someone you don't know and it's really awkward, you know, you're just kind of gazing into each other's eyes. So that, that happened for a moment. And he walked from this side of the cast register over to me, and he sticks his hand out like this. And so I look at him for a solid 10 seconds and don't say anything. And, and so I eventually just stick my hand out like this, and I'm thinking he's going to drop some change or something into my hand. And, and instead of change, he drops this big black toy tarantula. <laughs> Into my hand, I go, ah, and drops on the ground, and this guy just picks up his spider and doesn't say anything else and just walks out laughing. (laughs) It just goes to show you, like, the older that you get, you can get away with anything, man, like, anything that you want to do. Yeah, the first service, they were like, preach, preach. (laughs) Man, when I I get older, like, seven, eight, I'm just not going to wear pants anywhere, anywhere. That's, that's what I'm going to do. Like, and I was thinking about this, and it's like, man, I can just see. I'm going to have to call Cody and Jacob. It's going to be like a news headline. Pastor assaults veteran. Uh, man, it, it caught me by surprise. It caught me off guard. I'm not afraid of spiders. If it was a snake, it'd be a totally different story. But uh, it caught me off guard. And how many of you are like me in the sense of you like to be prepared for the things that come at you? You like to premeditate the things that are going to come your way so that you are prepared, so that you know exactly what to do and when to do it for the situations that, that you face. Who's like that in here this morning? Yeah, a few of us, a few of us, okay. Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to look in at, at, in our series of the Gospel of Mark to the second of three boat stories with Mark. And what's going to happen is the disciples are going to find themselves in this position where they're really shocked and a surprising twist comes out on the water. So if you have your Bible, go with me to Mark chapter 6. We're going to read 45 through around 52, and then we'll break that text down. If you have your phone, uh, your Bible app on your phone, feel free to pull that out too. Uh, There should be a Bible in front of you in the seat back if you want to just follow along with us. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 52, 45 through 52, and we'll read this together. Do you love Jesus, Rest Church? Are you ready to study the scripture this morning? Yeah. Yeah. All right, here we go. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 52. This is what it says. Immediately he, Jesus, made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came... The boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. Underline that in your Bible. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Underline that, it is I. It is I. Don't be afraid. And he, Jesus, got into the boat with them, the disciples, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves or the bread, but their hearts were hardened. So what do you do? What do you do when you're in a boat and a wave crashes in? A financial wave, a relational wave, a physical wave. What do you do when you get hit right in the face with a a wave? What do you say if it's not you, if it's someone else next to you at that point? What do you say? Where do you point them to? Where do you guide and direct them at? This morning, I I, I don't know what waves you're facing. I don't. I don't know what ship you're sailing out or what's coming to your world or your life. But can I submit this to you? Maybe the, the, the struggle you're experiencing, maybe Jesus has sent you there. Have you ever thought about that before? 
Because in this story, Jesus intentionally sends the disciples out. He knows exactly where they're going to be, and they end up, they wind up in this storm. Or maybe Jesus hasn't sent you into a storm that you're in this morning, but maybe instead he, he didn't do that, but he knows exactly where you're at. Can I tell you? He knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly what you're going through because he's been there. It didn't, bring, it didn't surprise God from where you're at. If you've ever wondered, God, where are you in this struggle? If you've ever wondered that, it's no mistake you're here this morning. You're in the right place today. And our big truth we're going to pull with us behind our ship today is this. Peace doesn't come from finding a lake without storms. Peace comes from having Jesus in the boat. And I, I didn't say that. Pastor John Ortberg did. I thought it was really good, really timely for this text. Peace doesn't come from finding a lake without storms. But instead, peace comes from having Jesus get in the boat with you. And so we'll pray, and then we'll just start ripping this text apart. So let's pray. Jesus, uh, we love you, and we thank you for, for who you are. God, thank you for wanting to hear our prayers even when we don't feel like praying. That you know exactly what we need, God. Exactly when we need it. And that you're not distant and disconnected, but you created our hearts, the, the innermost part of our being. You knit us together in our mother's womb. You put the pieces together, and so you know the pieces. There's no secret that's hidden from you. And so, Lord, we come to you this morning before Mark chapter 6 and ask you, God, the Holy Spirit, to, to teach us, to show us what, what you were saying to them and how that relates to us now so that we can be more like you, Jesus. Thank you for that. In your name I pray. Amen. So we'll, we'll just dive right into this wonder on the water. Let's look at verse, uh, the very first verse, verse 45. Verse 45 says, Immediately he, Jesus, made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. So this story in Mark comes off of another story that we read last week. If you weren't here, I'll just fill you in with the details. Jesus came, and him and his, along with his disciples, they had just a, a little bit of bread, and they had just a little bit of crappie, and they fed thousands of people thousands of people praise God for for babies amen right yeah we love babies here it's all good so Jesus he he feeds this this massive crowd 10 15 20 25,000 people which is a few uh, biscuits and some crappie it's a miracle and the crowd has seen this and so they're looking in going man if, if Jesus could do that what else could he do more specifically what could Jesus do for me and so Jesus is looking at this crowd with this really, that has this really politically charged uh, background, this mob, so to speak, and Jesus goes into crowd control mode. What he does, the text says that he dismisses the crowd. It's game over. Grab your t-shirt. The fish sticks are gone. Get your falafel on the way out. Go home. Jesus sends them out. He dismisses the crowd. He then directs his disciples to go ahead of him to a place called Bethsaida. Jesus ubers them a, a boat, and they head out before Jesus heads out. He dismisses the crowd. And what I want you to see in this is that Jesus, the captain of this whole plan, tells his disciples to go out ahead of him. The twelve go out before Jesus goes out. He leave, they leave before Jesus leaves. They're at the sea. He's on the shore Jesus purposely, intentionally, deliberately, and sovereignly sends them out into a storm. Did you catch that? Jesus sends them into a storm. His followers, he sends them out into a storm. He knows exactly where they're going to end up. He knows exactly where they're going, exactly what they're going through. And Jesus still sends them out. And this is a reminder for me and for you that we are ultimately guided by God's plans. Like me and you, we may have a lot of plans to do this or that or this or that and this. But ultimately, we submit to God's plan because when our plans don't work out the way that we think they should, ultimately, Jesus' plan is better anyway. Amen? And so we are guided by God's plan. And, 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 and I want you to know that Jesus, he might send you into some distress. 
Jesus might send you out into some distress. He might send you into a struggle. Do you know that? But why? Why does, why does he even... Why does Jesus even do that? Why, does, why would he send the people that he loved that are following him out into a storm? Well, I think one reason is because whenever we get into a place that we're not familiar with, whenever we go into a place that we've never been before, ultimately we are pushed, we are forced to rely on God's strength. And it shows us uh, his providence and his power ultimately when he takes away the fire extinguisher. When he closes the exit so that we are forced to go to him, to rely on him fully and, and wholly. It's in those places that we've never been that our faith in God can grow. Man, for me, the easiest one to relate this back to is planning a church. Like me and Cody and Jacob and Johan, the pastors here, we've never planted a church before. You know, this is uh, unfamiliar territory that we're in. And so what happens as a result of that is that there's some, there's some growth problems sometimes. There's some, there's some stretch marks that are noticeably left at times because uh, we, aren't, we aren't necessarily connected um, or, or backed by a governing agency, so to speak. We're kind of free agents in the church world. And so what that means is that a lot of times we have struggles financially and we have struggles intervally and we have struggles with growth. Like we have grown so fast at Rest Church that like we create one system and then that system's not, not fitting. It's not big enough. And so we have to like immediately stop and create another system so that it fits what we're doing. And it, that, it's frustrating. But ultimately, when things get complex, complexity ultimately eats away at simplicity, right? And so when that happens, we have to step back. And there's some, there's some struggle. There's some struggle in it because we've never been here before. We don't, we don't know what to expect. But in faith, we're trusting God. And, and for me personally, maybe you don't get that, but for me personally, uh, I, I have worked inside of the church for the past 13 years. And this, the past four years is the first time that I've, I've worked outside of the church in a very, very long time. But I did it to, to plant rest church. And with that has been some frustration. Can, is it okay if I'm just honest with you this morning? Is it okay? So part of that, I have, a, I have an amazing secular job. Amazing. Great people. Love them like family. They're awesome. Couldn't ask for more. But there are times I find myself where I'm, I'm trying to do work stuff and then I'm trying to do rest church stuff and I'm trying to mentor and we're, we're trying to cast vision and we've got a plan and all this stuff and, and then i got family time I'm trying to get back to. And there are, there are days I just want to run away. If I'm told that. I mean, there are times I just want to run away. And I'm not telling you that to, to, uh, for you to have pity on me or any of the other pastors. I'm not telling you that. We all have struggles. But I'm telling you that because even your leaders... We struggle when we get to a place that we've never been before. And so it's natural for you to struggle. And it's natural, actually, when you go, God, where are you in this? Where, where are you at? But anytime I get to that place where I'm frustrated or, or I don't understand, I pray. And God, the Holy Spirit, is such a great listener. Do you know that? God, the Holy Spirit, is such a great listener. And he'll gently guide me back to the right perspective, to a kingdom mentality that, hey, this ain't about you. And it ain't about me. It's not about us. It's about a king and his kingdom, though. And I'll think back to, like, the, the very first day at Rest Church. I bought a picture, actually, that you can see. This was day one, Rest Church. Our first Sunday, Easter Seals. All seven of us. And I think back and I go, man, how good is God? Look, we've been in a lot of churches around the country, big, small, and different. There is no church like Rest Church in the South, especially in the South. I don't mean just in Paducah. I mean in the South. We've seen salvation. We see salvation here almost every single week. We baptize people. We've seen marriages restored. We've seen sin broken. We see all of these things by the grace of God, and we've grown because of God's goodness toward, toward us in that. Man, this is, this is a good thing. And I'll sit back and go, I'll remember where we were and then where we are and just thank God. I mean, we come in here every week, guys, and we preach the Bible for like an hour. <laughs> and you come back. <laughs> Amen. 
It just doesn't make sense. It's not, and then you tell your friends about it. You're like, hey, they preached the Bible here for like an hour. And they're like, that sounds awful. And like, no, it's great. Come. <laughs> Man, God is present in that. God is present in our struggle. And the Holy Spirit has a, a gentle way of reminding us of where we were and where we are. I guess I could just end the sermon right there, right? But then you would leave early, and I can't let you do that. <laughs> verse 46, verse 46. After he, Jesus, had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. Jesus tells everyone goodbye, and I love the specificity of Mark. He says he went up on the mountain <laughs> to pray. Jesus leaves everybody, and he goes and he prays. And there's three times that Mark mentions Jesus praying in his gospel. And I think he does that intentionally. Like, we know Jesus prayed way more than three times, right? We know he did that. But Mark points out three to us. And I want to sit down on us for just a second. The very first one that we see is in chapter one of Mark. It's at the inauguration of Jesus' ministry launch. He's launching the church. He's launching the ministry. And he, it says this, Rising early, he, Jesus, left and went out to a, a desolate place, a place by himself. And there he prayed. The second time that Mark says it is, is this story, chapter 6, verse 46. He says, after he's taken leave of them, leaving the disciples again, they're out on the sea, Jesus stops, goes up the mountain to pray. And then the very last one Mark shows to us is in chapter 14. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus when he's about to walk to the cross. And it says that, and going on a little further, he fell on the ground, Jesus, and he prayed. And so what do we see from those three things that Mark points out to us? Well, I think it shows us that anytime Jesus has to make a critical decision in his life, he stops to pray. He stops to pray. Anytime he has a big decision, he stops to pray. And all three of these moments, they are filled. They, are, they have these uh, spiritual warfare overtones all over them. And so when Jesus senses the spiritual warfare around him, what does he do? He prays. He initiates conversation with his dad. He stops and he prays. Now, I like what John Piper relays about, about prayer. He says this, Until you believe that your life is a war, you cannot really know what prayer is for. He says, Until you believe that your life is a war, you can't really know what prayer is for. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you in here, I can see it on your face, man. How many of you in here are just beat up today? You don't have to raise your hand or say anything. Let me ask you this, are you, are, you, are you beckoning, are you calling, are you pleading, are you petitioning the God of the universe to move in, to step into your moment? And even more, if the God of the universe, Jesus, takes time out to pray, how much more do you and me need to stop to pray? If, if God has to stop to do it, how much more do you and I need that? Verse 47 through 49 says, And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he, Jesus, was alone on the land. And he saw that they, the disciples, were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, so, so the text says by this time it's really late in the evening. It's the fourth watch of the night, it says, which was somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. It's really late. It's super dark. The boat is out at the sea, but Jesus is alone on the land. Did you see that? The boat is out at sea, but Jesus is alone on the land. He's praying. He's spending time with his Father. And Jesus sees them, verse 48, he sees them from the shore, which is amazing in itself, but he sees them struggling. The text says, because the wind was against them. Now the Sea of Galilee, it's surrounded by this incredible mountain range, if you don't know that. It's down in the Jordan Valley. And along these mountains, and, and, and the, the lake itself was like 700 feet below sea level. So what would happen often is that when uh, the, the cold air, or when the warm air would rush down the mountains, the cold air would rise from the lake, and it would just create this massive, like these incredibly violent storms. In the Sea of Galilee, we create these incredibly violent storms there. And so this is a violent storm that's going on there. 
But the scene has shifted from this, you know, it's finding Nemo, everyone's fed, to perfect storm with George Clooney kind of thing. All right? Everyone's freaking out. It's dark. They're screaming. They're afraid. They're going like, should we throw Judas off to make the boat lighter? They're like, they're really scared of, of where they're at. It's the fourth watch of the night. It's the fourth watch of the night. It says, and I point that out because these guys have been rowing, straining for almost nine hours. They were set out to go to Bethsaida, but the violent storm has shifted them off to a different path, which will end up somewhere else, actually. But they've been rowing for about nine hours, and Jesus, the whole time they're in this storm, is on the, on the land. He's watching this. He's seeing this go on. He knows exactly what they're going through. He knows exactly where they're at on the water. And, and, and in essence, Jesus was testing the faith of the disciples to see if their security was in him and him alone or him and some other things. Can I tell you this? Ultimately, if you're a follower of Jesus, your security isn't in your security system at home. It's not in your gun. It's not in your dog. It's not in your spouse. It's not in your stable job. It's not in your family. But our security is in Christ and Christ alone. And so Jesus, what he does is he rips away every exit for the disciples so that they are forced, that they are pushed into this unfamiliar territory that they've never been before. Because they've been on the sea. They've accumulated years and hours on this sea. But they've never seen this before. And Jesus moves them from what was stable to unstable. He moves them from what was familiar to the unfamiliar so that there's a reliance that has to come through Him and Him alone. And can I tell you this, church? Whenever you choose to get in the boat and follow Jesus, storms happen. Okay? Whenever you like consciously make the decision to follow Jesus, like for real, storms are going to come. And so what do you do when you get hit right in the mouth with the wave? Well, you should expect it. You should expect that. Jesus reiterated it over and over and over again to us. I'll share just three with you. In, in, in Matthew 7, 14, Jesus says this. Matthew 7, 14, he says, For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Then in John 16, 33, Jesus says, Here on earth you're going to have many trials and sorrows. John 15, Jesus said, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. And otherwise, this shouldn't surprise us. Tell your neighbor, say, don't be surprised. Jesus reiterated, he said, don't be, don't be surprised. Don't act like it caught you off guard when something bad happens. And, and here's what we tend to do, though, when waves crash in on us. It's the natural response, right? I just got fired. And so we go, God, where are you? Or my kid gets sick. And I go, God, where are you? Or I don't get the promotion. I go, God, where are you? Or I let myself down. Or someone else lets me down. I go, God, where, where are you at in, in, in this? Where are you at in this moment? But then Jesus, the hero, he steps forward to rescue them. And he'll do the same for you. Look at verse 48. He came to them. Walking on the sea. I love this verse. He came to them. It's not the other way around. They didn't go to him. Jesus came to them. It's like he comes to you. Jesus in this moment does what no one else has ever done before or ever done after. And he takes a stroll out on the sea. And he comes to the disciples in the middle of their, of their storm. Jesus is ever present in every storm of your life, the big storms and the small ones. He is ever always present and he comes to you just in the same way as God when he stepped out of heaven to this earth for you and for me so we might be reconciled back to the Father. Jesus does the same thing here in the story in the Gospel of Mark. He steps to us and he came such a long way. 
John 6 tells us that the disciples, they were rowing. They were about three, three and a half miles out. So this isn't just like a, I, I walked a couple feet. Jesus goes out several miles in the dark, in the pitch black dark, walks out across the sea to the disciples to meet them. He goes to them. He came to them. He knows exactly where they are and exactly what they're going through. And I love, I love that, that Jesus uses the sea, the raging sea, as this reminder to the disciples that even though they are afraid of this thing, it's just a set of steps to him. Did you catch that? The thing that they are so afraid of, God literally walks on. And he says, this is no thing for me. I know you're freaked out. I know you feel like you're not in control. I, I get that. This is no thing for me. The living water steps out onto the water. Now, in Matthew chapter 14, if you want to write this down, you can. Matthew chapter 14, verses 28 through 31. That's where we're given this side story about uh, the apostle Peter. Where Peter... Um, sees Jesus out in the water. It's the same story. He sees Jesus out in the water. He's like, Jesus, tell me to come out to the water. And, and so Peter steps out on the water. He walks a few steps, and then he starts to take his eyes off of Jesus. So he starts to sink, and then Jesus has to reach down and save him. Really cool story. But Mark doesn't include that here. And I think it's intentional, actually. I think what he's trying to show us is that he's not so focused on the ones who are in the boat as he is on the one who's walking on the water. And so what he's doing is he's painting this picture for us, pointing back to the bread of life in John 6. You know, he, The bread of life has come and just fed these thousands of people with some bread. And then now all of a sudden the living water, John chapter 7 verse 38, has just walked on the water. He's saying it's not about the bread and it's not about the, the agua. This is about the living God who's now living among us. He's saying it's about him. It's about that deity. It's about that guy. It's about God. And the text says, verse 48, he meant to pass by them. We'll come back to that. Verse 49, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and, and, and cried out. And we've said this before in this series, church, but Jesus plus anything ruins everything. Jesus plus anything, it ruins everything. Because ultimately our security has to be found in God and in God alone. And, and the disciples here, they, they see this and they're, they're terrified. They're afraid. Verse 49 says, when they saw him walking, they thought it was a ghost. And I'll just remind you this morning that your, the, the call of following Jesus on your life is for you to let go. Tell your neighbor, say, let go. Let go, let go. It means let go of everything. That we surrender everything at the feet of Jesus. That he is in total control over all that we have and all that we do. And, and the, Jesus keeps looking at the disciples. He's going, hey, trust me. Hey, trust me. But the disciples, what they're hearing is they're hearing, trust me to fix my circumstance. And that's not what he's saying. Jesus is saying, trust me. The disciples are hearing, trust me to fix your circumstance. And that's not what he's saying, okay? That's not what he's saying. Do you know that God may not fix your circumstance? Like, let's put that on a t-shirt, right? This may not work out. <laughs> God might not fix your circumstance. He, he might not hear on this. He, can he? Yeah, 100%. A million percent. Will he? Maybe. Maybe not. Because ultimately, our, our circumstances, you know, the things around us that we see and the things around us that we hear, we're not supposed to live off of those things. When I said we're supposed to live off of the, the truth and the scripture that God has given to us as a compass. Because your eyes are going to deceive you. Your heart's going to deceive you. Your ears are going to deceive you. Even salt looks like sugar, right? So Jesus says this is, this is something you can, you can actually trust in that you can put your weight in. And so you're going, Adam, so what you're saying, my man, is, is you're going, when I can't pay my bills, God is still good? Yeah. When, it, when, when my kids get sick and there's nothing that I can do about it, God's still sovereign? Yeah. When I'm stuck in this position that I really don't want to be in and I'm not sure why I'm here in the first place, God is still holy? Yes. God remains the same. God never changes. Never. 
And so this trust me from Jesus isn't circumstantially based. It, it, it is with everything. I mean, at the bare minimum, he's saying, trust me with your life so you can go to heaven and not hell when you die. But it's so much, it's so much bigger than that. So much bigger than that. You can't trust everything you feel and you can't trust everything that you see. Okay, let's backtrack just for a second. Verse 48, I told you I was coming back there. This is my, one of my favorite verses in this. Verse 48, the end part, it says, He, Jesus, meant to pass by them. That little phrase there, it is so jam-packed. He meant to pass by them. When you first read it, it sounds a little weird, right? Like, Jesus, was he like trying to be that guy who pays for your, your, your lunch in front of you in the drive through but then pulls off so you can't see who it is? Like, is he meaning to just pass by, by them? Or is he, is he like testing the disciples' faith? You know, he doesn't show his faith, faith. And what, what's he trying to do? This, is, this sounds a little weird. He meant to pass by them. A better understanding of this comes from an idea that shows up in the Old Testament. It's called a theophany. Say theophany. Let's get on the same page. Say theophany. Yeah. So a theophany, it is where Jesus shows up in the Old Testament, okay? It's a, it's a manifestation of God. It's the Jesus block party has moved in, okay? That's what a theophany is. And, and, and what we see in the Old Testament is we see the Lord Jesus show up all the time. I'll give you just a couple of examples. In 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, verse 11, um, he shows up with the prophet Elijah, and this is what it says. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, and behold, and I underline it for you, the Lord passed by. Another example of this, that you might remember this one, um, this, there was an incident with a golden cow, and then Israel's future was kind of uh, up in arms, and, and so this is what Moses, this is God with Moses. Moses said, please Show me your glory. He says this to God. God, please show me your glory. And he said, God said back to him, he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you can stand on the rock while my glory passes by. There it is again. I will put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand until I have passed by, but my face shall not be seen. So you remember after this, Moses uh, sees the manifestation of the presence of God, and his face is literally reflecting the brightness of God's goodness. It's like he's just gotten into a fight with a bunch of glow sticks, you know, and he walks down off of this mountain, and everyone can see that his physical appearance is just different because God's glory passed by. Those theophanies with the Lord Jesus, were point, they were temporary. They were pointing forward to the time when Christ would come and be born to the virgin, the incarnation moment, and that Christ is here. And that's what he's saying in Mark 6. He's saying, I, am, I has passed by, that I have passed by. And so he's passing by the disciples to show his glory, to reveal his deity. And when they hear this, they automatically are connecting these two stories. This is the permanent appearance of God among us. And in fact, in John's gospel, Jesus said this to Philip once in John 14. Jesus said, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? I love this. Verse 48. I love this verse, man. He passed by then. What Jesus was saying is he was going, in the same way that I passed in front of Elijah, in the same way that I passed in front of Moses at Horeb, in the same way that I was walking with Adam and Eve in the garden, in the same way that I was in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the same way I passed by them, I'm passing by you. Take notice. And so he passes by them, but unfortunately they don't see it. Verse 49. They see him, but what did they, they thought he was a what? A ghost. So naturally they scream, ah! Right, their, their faces are pale. They're afraid. They're, they're, they're terrified. They think it's a ghost because, because people don't walk on water, right? Dead men don't get up unless you're God. And so the God of the universe steps out in, into the water and they scream. They don't, they don't see it yet. In verse 50, for they all saw him and they were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, 
Take heart, it is I. Don't be afraid. And Jesus got into the boat, verse 51, with them. And the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. Back to verse 50 for just a second. For they all saw him and were immediately terrified. The Greek for this is skid marks in your robe. They are afraid. They are terrified. But immediately, I love this, but but immediately Jesus speaks to them. He doesn't rebuke them, but he says this really gentle thing to them. And he says three things I want to point out. He says, take heart. It is I. Don't be afraid. Okay, you should write that down. Take heart. It is I. Don't be afraid. Take heart. It is I. Don't be afraid. So the take heart part, he's going, have courage. Have courage. It is I. will come back there. Do not be afraid as there is this action of fear that is in progress. And it's not a suggestion. It's a command from Jesus. He says, don't be afraid. He's commanding them. Stop what you're doing. Stop being afraid. And then he says, it is I, it is I. I want to camp out on this for just a second. In the real Greek, the real one, it's simply I am. Say I am. When Jesus says it, it is I, it's just I am. Have courage, take heart, because I am. That's what he's saying. Have courage, take heart, because I am. And now you might not catch why this is such a big deal um, yet, but you will in just a second. This idea comes from the Old Testament too. And so Jesus is painting a picture that, that they've grown up reading, they've grown up learning and studying, he brings it back to them. And so let me take you back to Exodus again for just a minute. In Exodus, this guy named Moses, he was chosen as the mouthpiece of God to go to this guy named Pharaoh. God picked Moses to go to Pharaoh. That, that, that Moses was going to um, help deliver God's people, Israel, who were in captivity. This is 2.4 million people, okay? This is a lot of people. And when God picks Moses, Moses is confused. He's overwhelmed. So Exodus 3.11, this is what Moses says. He says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt? God's going, you want a st- st- stuttering guy like me to go and to speak? Like, maybe you want to pick someone else to do the speaking part. You know, maybe I can be the prayer warrior and God says, no, 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 Moses, it's you that, that I'm picking. And, and I love that, that God doesn't respond to this with Moses. He doesn't give him a pep talk. I love that. God doesn't look at Moses and go, Moses, you can do this. He doesn't go, Moses, if you just believe in your smell, like you can, you can do all things through me. He, he, doesn't give him a, he doesn't pump him up in this moment. Instead, God answers Moses' question, who am I, with the same thing. Moses goes, who am I that I can do this? God says, it doesn't matter. Think about who am I. Did you catch that? Moses goes, who am I? God goes, it doesn't matter. Who am I? And so when God picks Moses, he never has intentions that Moses is going to be the one to actually do the delivering. God is relying on himself. He just needs a leader who can speak. He needs somebody with skin to go on his behalf. It's not Moses. I mean, it's definitely not Moses. It's God. And so God says back to him, who am, who am I? All along, God was counting on himself to pull off the victory. And so the story goes, Moses is like, okay, who am I supposed to tell him that sent me, though? Because God was speaking through a burning tree, <laughs> a burning bush. And Moses is like, no one's going to you know, believe that. Who am I supposed to tell them sent me? And for the first time in the history of mankind, God is about to reveal his name to Moses, which is so cool. See, prior to this time, generations before Moses... Everyone knew God is Yahweh. And it was such a revered title that whenever they would, they would write it out, they, wouldn't even, they would abbreviate it. They wouldn't even write it all out. They would, Y-H-W-H, they wouldn't write it all out because it was such a revered title. It means the God, the, the Most High God. And so it was really more of a description than a name. And, and, and Moses is going, well, who should I tell him sent me? And God, for the first time, reveals his, his name in, in Hebrew the word for I am is haya. Think of the karate kid. Haya. It, uh, it's got this connotation of the breath of God behind it. That's what, ha, 
ah, like that. It's got that kind of connotation behind it, the breath of God. And so in Exodus 3.14, this is what God says to Moses. Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. And he said this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. He says, go tell them that I am has sent you. The English translation of this, um, I am is I be. Say I be. I be. And so what God was, was saying to Moses and to me and you is that I am. I am always constant. I am never changing. I am unending. I am strong. I am powerful. I am enough. And so in that moment, it doesn't matter how not enough Moses is. It doesn't matter how not enough the disciples in the boat were. Because God is enough. He is the I am. He is the one running the show. He is inexhaustible. And he is immeasurable. And when, when, when this story comes up in Mark, Jesus is making this declaration that he is God. He is the I am of the Old Testament. He is God. He is the, the second person of the Trinity. He is all powerful and all knowing that he is I am. And that's what he's saying to the, the disciples there. That, that the I am has passed by them. The glory of God has just strolled on the sea. And even though the disciples won't totally get this picture until after the resurrection, Jesus still understands they have a lot of learning to do. Verse 52, finishing up. For they did not understand about the loaves of the bread, but their hearts, they were, they were hardened. Man, this is, this is incredible to me. After, after everything that they've just seen, they just watched this miraculous feeding of 25,000 people with just a few pieces of bread and some fish sticks. And then Jesus literally walks out on the sea to them. But they don't believe and said their hearts were hardened. They didn't, they didn't understand what this was about. And, and I think if we're honest, we all get this way because me and you will be like, God, I believe you can do anything. Until we get into a storm, until a wave hits us in the mouth. And then we're like, but my, my situation's a little different, you know? Like, God, I believe you're big enough for everybody else, but I struggle believing that you're big enough for me. That you're big enough to heal my, my mouth when I stutter. That you're, that you're strong enough to stand on the sea for me on my behalf. I think if we're honest, we all struggle with that a little bit sometimes. Believing that God is big enough. We, what I find so reassuring from this text, though, is that God doesn't rebuke them in that moment. Man, how good is that? God doesn't rebuke you in your ignorance. God doesn't rebuke you in your hard heart. But instead, He offers to us salvation and reconciliation back to the Father, and He understands. He knows exactly where you're at. Exactly. There's no surprise to him. Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. Jesus loves you more than you love yourself, which is a whole lot if we're honest. Jesus is more compassionate than you could ever be. He is more powerful than you can ever imagine. And he knows your needs more perfectly than you can describe because he made all of the pieces. Our God is big enough. The bread of life allowed his body to be broken in half so that me and you might receive a spiritual nourishment that we needed. Jesus then proceeded to walk across the stormy waters in the pitch black on his way to a cross to be murdered for you and for me. To take on the weight of our sin on his back so that we could get back to the Father. And then... Three days later, he rose again as a pattern for me and you. Yeah, we can celebrate that. So that just as Jesus rose from the, 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 the grave, just as Peter was risen from the water, it's a pattern for me and for you if we're in Christ, if we follow Jesus. When, when he says, take heart, he says, understand that I am. And so the real question for me and for you is, do we have enough confidence in God to believe that He is as big as He says He is? It's incredible. All of a sudden, Moses, he's, he's given God's name, His first name, the I Am, for the first time in history. 
And then all of a sudden, as Moses knows God's name, and as the disciples know God's name as I am, naturally Moses knows his name too. And we know our names. Because if God is I am, that means you and I, we're all I am nots. Catch that? I am not in control. I am not all powerful. I am not the solution to this. I'm not the one solving the equation. I'm not big enough, bad enough, strong enough, but I know someone who is the great I am. That's what God is saying in this moment, that he is big enough for you. And would you believe it, man? Would you believe it? The cross, the murder of Jesus stands at this pivotal moment in history, man. When, when skeptics look in at that and say, your God was, was murdered, your God was killed, it shows the strength of God, actually. That he was big enough to overcome this chaos, to allow his son to be murdered on our behalf. It shows his strength, not his weakness. And, and, and to be honest, you and I, sooner or later, we're going to face a crossroads, man. Where the sky gets dark and where the boat is starting to shake a little bit from the hurricane. And in that moment, who will you put your trust in? That's the question. Who will you put your trust in? Hey, thanks for hanging out with us today. We hope that this message has encouraged, challenged, and helped shape you a little more into the person God had dreamed you to be. If God has blessed you in any way through the ministry of Rest Church, or if there's something you need prayer for, go to our app under prayer requests so we may hear more about how God is impacting your story. We were never meant to do life alone, and so we're so thankful for a family like you to do life with. It's because of your generosity that the gospel is being spread through Rest Church. So if you would like to help forward the mission, feel free to give by texting the word GIVE to 270-366-7947, followed by your dollar amount. Thank you for letting us speak God's truth into your life each week.